Hey everyone and welcome to Just Finish Coding. My name is Sri Ram and in this new game dev series, you will learn how to build Pac-Man. This will have pretty much all of the actual game's features, including structured movements for the Pac-Man, pathfinding algorithms for the ghost AI, teleportation across the ends of the screen, the invincibility mode, and so much more. But before we go ahead, I must warn you, this project is definitely more on the difficult side of Scratch programming. In fact, this final game script has nearly 3000 lines of code. So I definitely would advise complete beginners to avoid this for now and try out something simpler, for example, my Connect4 project. Nonetheless, if you do have a reasonable idea of the working of most scratch scripts, effects and nested loops, then fret not because I will go over everything step by step and explain the code to the best of my ability. Okay, before we go on, here is a nice bonus for you. Rather than starting off from scratch, you can use all of the game assets and images that I made by myself. To get this file, click on the link in the description labeled downloadable files and download the file called starter. Also, if you are stuck with some bugs during any part of video, then you can just download that particular file and then move on with the remaining tutorials. All right, once you load up the starter file in the Scratch online editor, you will be greeted by the level costume, a black background and a ghost. There are a bunch of other sprites that are hidden and I will explain what they are used for in the next few tutorials. A few of you are probably wondering if you can load up one of your own maps as a costume instead. I highly recommend that you do not do so. I made this map with a lot of precision using a tile generator and this map was literally drawn tile by tile. This becomes very important when we get into the pathfinding algorithm, so just stick with this map. Fair enough. Now head over to the backdrops tab and switch the background to be the empty one. We will switch this back to the black background later on, but for the moment just follow along. This will help us see the grid a lot better. Next, go to the code tab. When the green flag is clicked, broadcast a new message called init level and wait. Then broadcast a new message called init grid and wait. Then broadcast a new message called init pacman and wait. And finally broadcast a new message called start game, this time with no wait. These should be pretty self-explanatory. For each of the init messages, we will ensure that the desired sprite is ready. Next, to control when the game ends, create a new variable called game over. I'd recommend sticking to my naming convention. Name all the public variables for all sprites with all uppercase and the private variables for a particular sprite with all lowercase. For boolean variables such as this one, add a question mark to the end. Okay, after the init grid event, set game over to no. That's all for the moment in this stage now. Let's head over to the level sprite. After init level, go to the center of the screen and then show. Yeah, it's very simple. Onward now to the more complex sprite, the grid. After init grid, we must set up a number of variables. So first create a new variable for all sprites called tile width. This is the width of each imaginary tile. Then create two more variables called grid rows and grid columns again for all sprites. These two should be pretty self-explanatory. Okay, two more variables both for all sprites. The first is offset x and the second one can be called offset y. Now, we must set each variable to its intended value. First, set tile width to 19. A few of you may be wondering whether this number is random or intentional. The answer is that it's very intentional and if we do set up different numbers, the program will end up with a lot of bugs. 
you can see here from my tile editor that I have 19 rows and 19 columns. But this is not where the number comes from. For this, we must understand how much space each tile occupies not here, but on the scratch screen. Since the map is a perfect square, it fits completely on the y-axis, but not across the x-axis, as can be seen. There are only 360 pixels on the scratch y-axis, and I've set the board to be slightly more than that, to 361 pixels. Now some quick division. There are 19 tiles, and the total space occupied on the y-axis is 361. So the tile width, or if you'd like to call it tile height, is 361 divided by 19, which is equal to 19. I know this was quite a long explanation, but when you start to create games similar to this on your own, you will have to do all these calculations yourself. Getting back to the code, set grid columns to the floor of 361 divided by tile width. This is a flat value, so the floor isn't technically necessary, but it will be if we want to slightly increase or decrease the costume size. In our case, we won't, but still, it's good to have it in. The same thing for grid rows, since the tile is a perfect square. Now, Set offset x to negative 181 and then set offset y to the same value. Offset x, offset y represents the bottom left coordinate of this level when the sprite is centered. This should technically be 180.5, which is 361 divided by 2 but Scratch rounds this off anyway during movements, so 181 works. After this, we must encode the level in a grid list. This contains a lot of operations, so create a custom block for this, making sure to run without screen refresh. Throw it in after the variables, and let's define it. First, create a new list called grid for all sprites. It will be useful for debugging if we use the pen effects, so click on add extension and choose the pen extension. At the start, erase all. In order for us to stamp the sprite, we must first show it. Delete all of grid and then set the size to tile width minus 1 divided by 8 multiplied by 100%. What are we doing here? In short, we are ensuring that the grid tile is set to be slightly less than 19 by 19 pixels, that is the tile width. If you see the costume, you will notice that it is just an 8 by 8 square. Tile width by 8 will give us the necessary magnification, and we multiply this by 100 since this input must be a percentage. It's kind of like this, if we wish to double the size of a sprite, we set it to 200%. If we wish to triple it, we set it to 300% and so on. In each case, we multiply the magnification value by 100. We are also using tile width minus 1 instead of just tile width, so that there is a small space between each tile. Now, set y to offset y plus tile width divided by 2. Repeat grid rows and each time set x to offset x plus tile width divided by 2. And then repeat grid columns. In essence, at the start of the nested loop, we are moving to the tile at the bottom left. Offset x, offset y refers to the bottom left point. So to go to the center of the bottom left tile, we change x and y by half of the tile width. This will ensure that the grid tile is perfectly snapped. Back to scratch. Each time, check if the level is touched. If yes, then add hash to grid, and if not, add a blank item to the list. To show visually what's going on, set the ghost effect to zero in the first case, and 80 in the second case. Following this, stamp. 
We have to move the grid tile across the level, so change X by tile width in the inner loop and change Y by tile width in the outer loop. At the end of this process, hide. Okay, now for some testing. Hit the green flag and wow, just look at that result. It's even more beautiful when we move the level across and you can see that the walls are dark and the empty tiles are faded. If you hit the green flag again, the level should go back to normal. If you used all of my sprites and costumes without changing anything, then you too should have the same result. If, however, your output is something like this, then go into the costumes of the grid sprite and slightly decrease the size using the Alt key. Test it again and if you decrease it enough, it should work. That is wonderful. And before we end this video, let's create some custom blocks that will aid us tremendously later on. Before blocks, we must create some private variables, tile x, then tile y, then index, and finally tile. Create a custom block called get tile at x, x pause, y, y pause, with x pause and y pause being inputs, and making sure to run without screen refresh. Great. Set tile x to the floor of x pause minus offset x divided by tile width. Similarly, set tile y to be the floor of y pause minus offset y divided by tile width. This should not be too difficult to understand. Without a flow, the result will often be a decimal. We just have to be a little careful here. Tile X and tile Y will contain the correct outputs for all the tiles within the level, but for stuff outside the level, the values will be incorrect. The flip side is that this is a bug we can actually take advantage of when we program the Pac-Man movement through the portals on the left and right, but more on that in future videos. Next, set index to tile x plus 1 plus tile y multiplied by grid columns. Remember, the tile's grid starts from 0, 0, at the bottom end. 0, 0 must have an index of 1, so we add 1 to tile x. Each time tile y changes by 1, we must add an entire row of tiles. A row contains a total of grid columns tiles, so we multiply that with tile y. This may be a bit confusing at first, but you should understand this with some thought. Finally, set tile to item index of grid. This will just tell us whether a tile is a wall or an empty space. Great, now the final block for this video, position at index with an input of index. Make sure to run without screen refresh. This block will give us the tile x and tile y values for a given tile index. Set tile x to index minus one mod grid columns and tile y to the floor of index minus one divided by grid columns. This is just the reverse of setting the index. This is best illustrated with an example. Here is a two by three grid and the tile with the index number five is highlighted. Five minus one mod three gives a value of one, which is the correct tile x. Five minus one divided by three gives a value of 1.3333. The floor of this is just one, which is the correct tile y. All right, the last thing we'll do in this video is creating a simple script to use these blocks. This will also be very helpful for debugging later on. After the start game event within a forever loop, use the get tile at block with an input of mouse x and mouse y. And that is pretty much it. Show the four variables as well as the grid list and then test the program. Wow, this is super interactive and fun to play with. Like I mentioned, it works great as long as we keep within the level. Another important thing is that the stamping on the screen is purely for cosmetic purposes and debugging. 
The real purpose of the grid sprite is to encode the image of the level into the grid list. This is so incredibly useful to work with as you will see in future parts. If you've enjoyed this video then please make sure you leave a like and also don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thanks for watching and I will see you in part 2.